Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. Brothers and sisters, before we begin our program today, I have a, a confession to make to you. It's something that, since you listen to us each week, you have a right to know. To know a little bit about this person who's talking with you. I've fallen in love with a very beautiful woman. The most beautiful woman, in fact, ever to walk on the face of the earth. She's a married woman and has a child. Well, actually, her child's an adult now. This lady is warm, compassionate, loving, always cheerful, generous almost to a fault, and very supportive. She never complains, never chastises. This lady knows my faults, but doesn't let them stand between us. I must tell you that I am married also to a very beautiful, wonderful woman and mother, my first true love. I fell in love with her the moment I first saw her. The new lady in my life, however, is always at my side, even when we're apart. She refuses to give me up. Our relationship has become too strong for any kind of a separation. Even now, as I speak with you about her, I can sense her presence right here by my side. Well, I've cleared my mind by bearing my soul to you, so I guess we'd better continue with our program. Oh, I forgot one important thing, the lady's name. Her name is Mary. Sometimes I call her Maria, and sometimes Miriam. She's also known as the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception, Theotokos, which is a Greek term for Mother of God. Well, there you have it. You know everything about me now that is worth knowing. Since we are now well into Lent, and Good Friday is only a few weeks away, and since we only have one program each week, today we're going to start introducing you to the Passion. Today we'll be talking about some of the events leading up to the Passion, and then we'll get more intense as we get closer to Holy Thursday and Good Friday. We'll also give you a little bit of Old Testament history, just a little bit, to give you a flavor for how all of these events are tied to one another. When Abraham was 100 years old, a son was born to him and Sarah. His name was Isaac. Eventually, God tested the faith of Abraham. He said to Abraham, Take your son Isaac, your only son, and bring him with you to the land of Moriah. There you will give him up to me as a burnt offering upon a mountain that I will show to you. Grieved and broken-hearted as he was, Abraham had faith in the Lord and did not question him. He took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac's shoulder to carry. And father and son went off together to climb the mountain where the offering would be made. Please note that the wood was carried on Isaac's shoulder, the wood that would be 
the cause of his offering. Later Jesus would carry the wood of the cross for his offering. At the last minute the angel of the Lord called out to him, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand upon the boy, do not harm him. Now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from him. Abraham looked around, and he saw in a thicket a ram caught by his horn, and he gave the ram as a sacrifice. He called the place Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. In the fullness of time, the woman of Genesis 3.15, the greatest of all women in the Bible, was born to Joachim and Anne of the tribe of David and a descendant of Abraham. Anne was fruitless and prayed constantly and fervently for an end to her barrenness. At last Anne gave birth to the Immaculate Conception, Mary. In time, God sent his messenger as an ambassador, the angel Gabriel, to a virgin in Nazareth with an invitation to her to be the mother of the Word, the mother of the Son of God. And the virgin's name was Mary. When asked the question, Our Lady responded, Let it be done unto me according to thy Word. She said yes to the invitation of Gabriel to be the mother of the word. She became the second Eve. The Holy Spirit then overshadowed her and she immediately conceived at that moment the God-man, the second Adam. The first Eve was born out of the rib of the first Adam. The second Adam was born out of the womb of the second Eve. The first Eve said yes to Satan and sin. The second Eve, Mary, said yes to God and to redemption. With her consent, two wondrous things happened. A woman, while remaining a virgin, became a mother. And more wondrous yet, a woman became the mother of her own creator. On earth, the word had a mother without a father. And in heaven he had a father without a mother. At that moment, infinity confined himself in the womb of a mere mortal woman. The bodiless took upon himself a body. The invisible made himself visible. He who is without beginning began. The Son of God became the Son of Man and prophecy was fulfilled. This is the girl chosen from all women to give God the color of his eyes and of his hair. She was to teach the word to speak in her own accent. She was to help the Almighty walk his first baby steps. She was to give him the body and blood in which he would live and suffer and die to redeem us all. She was called Mary. Thirty years later the mother and her son were invited to a wedding banquet, but the bride and groom were embarrassed. They were out of wine. Mary said, They have new wine. Jesus answered, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. She, as if disregarding him, turned to the servants and said, Do whatever he tells you. And to all of us, brothers and sisters, down through the ages, everyone who's part of humanity, these words are directed to us. Do whatever he tells us. Do whatever Jesus tells us to do. It was then that he turned water not only into wine, but into the best wine, and six jars full, about 120 gallons. However, she knew full well, Mary did, that by initiating his public ministry, she would be hastening what he and she 
always feared most as his Calvary. Nonetheless, undoubtedly inspired by the Holy Spirit, she knew that the time had come. It was as though heavenly protocol demanded that it was the mother, the woman, who should initiate his public ministry, and hence the road which would also lead her to the foot of the cross. Three years later, as his ministry was approaching its end, there was another banquet. This was called the Last Supper. Simeon's son had prepared the lamb. It was fixed upon a spit, the four legs fastened to a cross piece, and the hind ones to the spit. It looked so much like Jesus on the cross. While the apostles were eating the meal of the Last Supper, Jesus conversed with them quite lovingly, but he afterwards became grave and sad and said, One among you will betray me, one whose hand is with me in the dish. Later Jesus said, The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man to whom the Son of Man shall be betrayed. It were better for him if he had never been born. Later Jesus, while standing in the midst of the apostles, spoke to them quite solemnly for a long time. He spoke of his kingdom, of going to his Father, and he told them that before leaving them he would give over to them all that he possessed. All that he possessed. Then he gave them instructions about penance and knowledge about confession of sin, contrition, and justice. As it was during the whole of the Paschal Supper, Jesus' demeanor was most touching and gracious as he washed the apostles' feet. He was at that time ever so full of love. He did not perform it as if it were a mere ceremony, but more like a sacred act of love streaming directly from his heart. During his instructions, Jesus had spoken of the washing of the feet as of a purification from daily falls, because the feet, coming in continual contact with the earth in walking, are constantly liable to become soiled. In other words, this was a spiritual foot washing, a kind of absolution. When Jesus washed Judas' feet, it was a most touching and in a loving manner. He pressed them to his cheek, and in a low tone bade him enter into himself, for he had been unfaithful and a traitor for the past year. But Judas appeared not to notice, and addressed some words to John. This aroused Peter's anger, and he exclaimed, Judas, the master is speaking to you. Then Judas made some vague and evasive remarks, such as, Lord, far be it from me. Jesus' words to Judas had passed unremarked by the other apostles, for he deliberately spoke softly, and they did not hear. Moreover, they were busy putting their sandals on. Judas' treachery caused Jesus much pain. Jesus next delivered a sermon on humility. He told them that he who was the greatest among them should be the servant, and that in the future they should, in humility, wash one another's feet. Again Jesus prayed and taught, his words glowing with fire and love. He then took the plate with the morsels of bread and said, Take this and eat. This is my body, which will be given up for you. While saying these words, he stretched forth his hand over it, as if giving a blessing. And as he did so, a brilliant light emanated from him. His words were luminous, as also was the bread, which appeared as a body of light, and entered the body of the apostles. It was as if Jesus himself flowed into them. All of this, all of them, were penetrated with life and bathed in light. 
Judas alone was in darkness. Jesus next raised the chalice by its two handles to the level of his face and pronounced the words of consecration. Take this and drink. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for many, so that sins will be forgiven. While doing so, his holy, transfigured body became transparent. He called Peter and John to drink from the chalice while yet it was in his hands, and then he sat down. With a little spoon, John removed some of the wine, which had become the precious blood, from the chalice into small cups which Peter handed to the apostles, who two by two drank from the same cup. Jesus then gave to the apostles an instruction full of mystery. He told them how they were to preserve the blessed sacrament in memory of him until the end of the world. He taught them the necessary formats for making use of and communicating it, and in what manner they were to teach and publish the mystery. When Jesus eventually left the Senecal with the eleven, he led them to the Mount of Olives by an unfrequented path through the valley of Josephat. While walking in the valley with the apostles, Jesus said that he would one day return hither, meaning to that spot, to that valley. But he would not be poor and powerless as he now was. He would return to judge the world. The following day, the sacrifice of Isaac was renewed on Calvary. But whereas on the Mount of Moriah God supplied the victim, a ram, to be substituted for Isaac and spared both the life of the son and the hearts of his father and mother, on Calvary God fully accepted both the sacrifice of his son and the broken heart of his mother Mary, the second Eve. Mary, the you, who witnessed her lamb, slaughtered as she stood helplessly by. It was about nine o'clock when Jesus reached Gethsemane with the disciples. Darkness had fallen upon the earth, but the moon was lighting up the sky. Jesus was very sad. He bade eight of them to remain in a little garden. He took Peter, John, and James the Greater with him, crossed the road, and went on for a few minutes until he reached the Garden of Olives, further up the mountain. He glanced around on all sides, saw anguish and temptation gathering about him like dense clouds filled with frightful pictures. It was at that moment he said to the three apostles, Remain here and watch with me. Pray, lest you enter into temptation. Jesus went a few steps forward and crunched down into a grotto formed by an overhanging rock. It was about six feet deep, and shrubs hanging from the rocks towering over the entrance made it a place to which no eye could see. His sorrow and anguish increased. He withdrew tremblingly, he was trembling as he withdrew into the back of the cave, like one seeking shelter from a violent tempest, and there he prayed. A little side note here, ladies and gentlemen, this cave into which Jesus entered was the very cave where Adam and Eve first lived when they were expelled from the Garden of Paradise. Jesus saw in countless forms all the sins of the world with an innate hideousness. This enormous mass of sin and iniquity passed before the soul of Jesus in an ocean of horrible visions, and he offered himself as an expiatory sacrifice for all, and implored that all their punishment and chastisement should fall upon him. It was about half past ten when he tottered rather than walked to where the three disciples were awaiting him. He clasped his hands, and sinking down from grief and exhaustion, he said, Simon, are you sleeping? At these words they awoke, and in his spiritual dereliction he then said, 
What? Could you not watch one hour with me? Jesus returned, and he writhed in agony and wrung his hands. As if overwhelmed, he fell repeatedly on his knees, while so violent a struggle went on between his human will and his repugnance to suffer so much for so thankless a people. The sweat poured from him in a stream of heavy drops of blood to the ground. During this agony of Jesus, the Blessed Virgin was overwhelmed with sorrow and anguished, even though, even though she was not with her son. She was with Mary Magdalene and Mary Marcus in a garden adjoining the house. She had sunk on her knees on a stone slab and was profoundly distracted interiorly, seeing only and feeling only the sufferings of her divine Son. She saw the Spirit of Jesus agonizing in sweat and blood. Jesus was also stirred with thoughts of her. He saw and felt also his Blessed Mother's sorrow and anguish. When he was arrested in the Garden of Olives, they bound him with the greatest crudeness and barbarous brutality. The Pharisees, meanwhile, uttered insolent and scornful words at him. They bound his hands upon his chest, and in a cruel manner, with sharp new cords, they pitilessly fastened the wrist of the right hand to the left forearm, just below the elbow, and that of the left hand to the right forearm. They put around his waist a broad girdle, studded with sharp points, and bound his hands at the end of with links of willow which were fixed to the girdle. Around his neck they laid a collar on which there were points and instruments to wound, and from it hung two straps, which, like a stole, were crossed over the chest and bound down to the girdle so tightly that his neck was not free to move. At four points of this girdle were fastened long ropes, so that the executioners could drag him in any direction they wished, according to their wicked will. They led Jesus around the roughest roads, over rocks and stones and mire, keeping the long ropes stretched while they themselves sought better pathways in which to walk. It was towards midnight when Jesus was led through the courtyard into the palace of Annas. His head was bowed, his garments wet and spotted with mud, his hands fettered, his waist bound by ropes, the ends of which the archers held. Annas could scarcely wait for the arrival of poor Jesus. He was beaming with mischievous joy. He was then led to Caiaphas and once more had to undergo further horrible mockeries and insults. At one stage Caiaphas, infuriated by the wrangling of two witnesses, rose from his seat, went down a couple of steps to Jesus and said, Will you answer nothing to the testimony against you? He was annoyed that Jesus would not look at him. At this the bullies pulled Jesus' head back by the hair, and with their fists cuffed him under his chin, but his glance was still downwards. Caiaphas angrily raised his hands and said in a tone of rage, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Most Blessed God. A solemn silence fell upon the clamoring crowd. Jesus then said, in a voice inexpressibly majestic, a voice that struck awe into all hearts, I am. Thou sayest it, and I say to you, Soon you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power of God, and coming in the clouds of heaven. When Jesus solemnly declared that he was the Christ, the Son of God, it was as if all hell grew terror-stricken before him, and as if it launched the whole force of its rage against him by means of those gathered in the tribunal of Caiaphas. Now they exercised their villainy upon Jesus in a manner altogether frantic and irrational. 
They struck him with their fists and sticks, threw him from side to side and spat on him. They had already forcibly and painfully pulled and torn much of the hair of his beard and covered him with mud and spittle. They also passed a wet, smeary rag over his face and shoulders as if cleansing him, although in reality they were rendering him more filthy than he was before. Well, my friends, we'll start our next program with the scourging of the pillar, at the pillar. Our Lord underwent a lot for us. Here's a little prayer that we might want to say right now and take a little break from all the suffering that Jesus was going through. And yet, it's not separate from it. If you would like to know God, look at the crucifix. If you would like to love God, look at the crucifix. If you want to serve God, look at the crucifix. If you hope for eternal happiness, look at the crucifix. If you wonder how much God loves you, look at the crucifix. If you wonder how he tries to prevent you from the yawning jaws of hell, look at the crucifix. If you wonder how much he will help you to save your immortal soul, look at the crucifix. If you wonder how much you should forgive others, look at the crucifix. If you wonder how much your faith demands of you in humility, poverty, charity, meekness, and every virtue, look at the crucifix. If you want to know what unselfishness and generosity are, look at the crucifix. If you wonder how far your own unselfishness should go to bring others to Christ, look at the crucifix. If you want to understand the need for self-denial and mortification, look at the crucifix. If you wish to live well, look at the crucifix. If you wish to die well, look at the crucifix. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us together. We had a good program today. And ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to come back again next week, same time, same station. We will continue our talk on the Passion. And we hope that in the meantime, what we've said today will enrich your hearts and your souls. Let's say a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And spread the effect of the flame of love over all humanity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's program and that you'll tune in again next week and the continuing weeks right up to Good Friday and Easter and beyond. We will be here for quite a while because we enjoy being with you. Keep us in your prayers if you will please. You take care now and God bless. Thank you.